Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for making time out of your day to come to this digital event. My name is Patricia Trutescu. I am the marketing manager for Books in North America. And you are in for a treat. So again, this uh, video will be, this webinar will be recorded. Attendees will get a chance to watch this video later and share it with their colleagues afterwards. The event will take the form of a 60-minute roundtable discussion between Steve Elliott, our senior mathematics editor, and Micah, the author of the book, Bitcoin, A Game Theoretic Analysis. And they will be joined by speakers today, Matthew Pines, Matthias Venturin, Xavier Ferreira, and Bennett Tomlin. First, to establish a few ground, ground rules, um, after the 60 minutes of the discussion, we will have time for questions and answers. All participants' microphones will be muted and cameras will be turned off for the entire event. Um, for anyone who wants to ask any of the speakers questions, please answer them, put, put them in the chat where the speaker and uh, the moderator will be able to read them. Your questions should not be visible to the public. And now, without further ado, I am going to hand off the floor to Steve Elliott. Thank you, Patricia. As everyone said, I'm Steve Elliott. I'm senior editor for mathematics here at the Groider. I think we're in for a real treat today, and our panelists are very knowledgeable. Speaking of which, uh, why don't we start the panelists, I'll allow the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Michael, why don't we start with you and just give a bit of your background and uh, then we'll just move on through the rest of the panelists and we'll get started. Hi, um, I'm Micah Warren. I'm associate professor at the University of Oregon. I study mathematics. Uh, most of the time I study differential geometry and uh, partial differential equations, but I've kind of been looking at this on the side over the last uh, you know, 10 to 12 years. Um, and now I guess I have a book on Bitcoin. Okay, there you go. Okay, who's next? Matthew Pines, and then we'll go to Bennett and then Matthias. Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, my name is Matthew Pines. I'm the director for security intelligence at the Krebs Demos Group, which is a geopolitical and cybersecurity uh, advisory firm. Uh, I'm also a national security fellow at the Bitcoin Policy Institute, which is a think tank uh, devoted to the, the research on um, public blockchains. Thank you. Bennett. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Bennett Tomlin. I'm the head of research for Protos Media, a cryptocurrency media company, and I am the co-host of the Crypto Critics Corner podcast. So be sure to check it out. If you want to put the, um, well, we can put the uh, the name of the podcast in the uh, chat if you want at some point, please. Okay, Mateus, over to yeah. you. Yes, I'm Matthias. I'm currently a postdoc at, at Harvard, um, the School of Engineering. Uh, I have been uh, researching incentives in algorithm design. So that's how I, I got interested in Bitcoin and like blockchain generally, like understanding like what are the incentives behind the designers of blockchain and, and cryptocurrency protocols. So I'm looking forward to, to share uh, some of those insights. Thank you, Matthias. Okay, so we're going to get it started here. And Micah, I know you said a little bit about the book, but can you give our, our, uh, our participants just a brief overview of the book and what, you know, just curious, why do you, well, I, I know, well, I'm not sure I know what, I'm glad you wrote it, but why did you feel that, you, that it was the time to get this book out? And what do you hope that people learn from the book and how can it, how can it help them? Well, I mean, I, I've been watching this space for, you know, 10 to 12 years. Um, people have talked about the game theory a lot. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the game theory is kind of confined in like podcasts and blogs and a lot of this game theory which is discussed kind of tends to be from either one side or the other you know one side being hey this is going to go to a million dollars you better buy it now and other people saying um this is a joke it's going to collapse tomorrow people have been saying that since 2011 um but it's obviously not going to collapse tomorrow it's here it's due you know people are using it uh, nation states are adopting it um it's something which a lot of you know, a lot of value has gone into. Um, so we need to take a serious look at how it actually is going to work going forward. What are the incentives to, that are keeping it moving? And are these incentives going to continue to keep it moving um, in the future? It's been fine for 15 years, um, but a lot of the major security parameters are going to be changing. 
um, perhaps in the next 10, 15 years. So, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of have a, I don't know, just some some basis for a, a more academic um, nuanced discussion about overall security. Sure. Okay. So quick, really quick, I think one of our panelists have it. I don't have it because I I'm on the road and I left the book. Could somebody hold up the book so our friendly <laughs> so our folks can see it? Micah, you gotta go. There it is. And you'll notice that Micah's also, I don't know, he did a uh, nice cover post for LinkedIn with the book from from Ireland. So that that was kind of cool. Okay. Anyway, all right. So Micah, now that we've thanks for that. Um, just let's I'm gonna dial it back a little bit and just give us a quick summary for the lay people on the phone. Um, on the, I'm sorry, on the, on the webinar. What, just quick summary, what is, what is just overall quick generalization? What is Bitcoin? How does it work? And then we'll just dive right in. So go ahead. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, Bitcoin, it's a peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency means that most of the transactions, well, all the transactions are going to be messages, which go out to the network saying I'm transferring you know, this coin to someone else. Um, these have to be signed with a cryptographic signature. Um, the cryptography, it's called asymmetric encryption. It's been around for 40 or 50 years, um, but it's actually kind of a very difficult problem to actually make sure that one person who has sent out a, a message, broadcast a message to the network saying they're transferring a coin, um, has not done that again, saying they've transferred that same coin to somebody else. This creates a problem called the double spin problem. And this solution requires some social consensus. It's not just something you can solve you know, by cryptography or, or some algorithms. You have to figure out how to get people to agree. And this is not an easy problem. Um, so you know, okay. Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever they are, uh, figured out a way to do this. And this has been working for the last 15 years. Um, it uses something called proof of work and you know, organizing, the, organizing the transactions into blocks, which occur roughly every 10 minutes, um, roughly about 2000 transactions every block. Um, and every miner has to provide a proof of work, which is essentially a computational needle in a haystack where they have to just grind out trillions and trillions of computations until they get lucky enough to, to write the block. And if they write the block, they get to credit themselves, issue themselves new Bitcoin. Wow, that's up now. Okay, so quick question here. So when you say individuals or Bitcoin miners, can you kind of define, I, this is probably doesn't, it's not possible to define this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, so we're not talking about little pe you know, people, millions of people, or are we talking about million pe millions of people franking away at their computer? We're talking about like server farms, right? Well, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, yes, it was. Um... You know, there are a lot of people that have mined bitcoins on their laptop, like hundreds of them. You know, it used to be something you could do with your laptop. You could you could mine lots of bitcoins. Well, that was when the it was this that was when Bitcoin was a dollar or 50 cents or something like that. So it was not it was reasonable that you could do this um, with your laptop. Of course, as the value has gone from, you know, 30 cents to a dollar to thirty dollars to a thousand dollars, like you had these large corporations filling up warehouses with very special machines. And so Typically today, it's not, you're, you know, an individual miner is not going to be able to find a block, you know, do all these really, really heavy computations and find this block. An individual miner, with, which just has like, like a single machine, might join a pool to get a share of a block. But it's, but it's, yeah, not, but it's, it's, it's been, be larger. been taken over by capitalism or corporate entities or whatever, I guess. Now. Okay, just a quick, you know, I've heard a lot about this the number that's been bannered about 21 million. What is this, Ben, maybe you can tell us, what is the significance of 21 million? And why is this the magic number, as we say, or as people say? Well, in the current implementation of Bitcoin as it is, 21 million is the total number of Bitcoins that will ever be issued. As Mike alluded to in the process of mining, in each block, the miner gets an opportunity to issue themselves new Bitcoin. When the network started, this was a much larger amount of Bitcoins, and every four years or so, that gets cut in half, the amount of new Bitcoins you can issue per block, and that keeps going and going until it eventually drops to zero once we hit 21 million issued, which will happen more than a century from now, so most likely. It's interesting uh, that, you're, that our panelists and everything, I, I appreciate that, that you're concerned about this, that what happens <laughs> 100 years from now. 
Uh, well, and, yeah, so that's yeah. And, and so the reason it's important is like for two reasons. One, it became like a symbol of kind of the Austrian economic side of Bitcoin. Having this hard cap made it like the hardest currency. And there are people who believe that's an advantage for it. The other part is, as Mike alluded to, we have this set of incentives that keep the miners operating. And so as that new amount of Bitcoin gets smaller, their incentives to like continue mining on that same chain can also change. And so some of the attacks we're discussing today are, in a sense, theoretical in that they've never happened, but they become more and more important as these incentives change over time. And so that's like why the 21 million gets really important with a lot of the like game theory Micah discusses in the book. Okay, great. I get it. Okay, so Micah, we'll throw it back to you. Can you talk about what's commonly known as failure node analysis and how that works? And how does that play into to game theory or what types of failure nodes could we could we see or do you explain discuss in the book, I guess? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of ways, you know, you, you could consider Bitcoin to have failed. Um, like you might say it's failed if something which was supposed to be a decentralized currency is taken over by a single corporation or a single group of corporations. Um, and according to the rules of Bitcoin, the 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 if there's if one entity has more than fifty percent of this hash power, they can take over and they can censor the transactions and they can, you know, mine. Um, you know, they, they can mine as they see fit. And so some people would consider this failure. Um, other people would see this is as it just can. It's how it's designed to work. Um, and so. One question, a really important question looking in the next 10, 15 years is what if this were to happen? Like what if, you know, 15 years from now, there is some sort of, a, I don't know, a, a, a lull in the market and some of the mining companies need to get bought out. And then all of a sudden one day we wake up and some corporation is controlling 60% of the hash rate. Um, are we concerned by that? Is this something, you know, is, is Bitcoin no longer valuable or is it just is it still great is it still a hedge against an inflate you know against inflation is it still something people in in argentina or turkey or other countries that they're you know have issues with their currency can they still use it um so that's that's one failure mode is is centralization or monopolization mm -hmm. the other one which maybe is less likely but still could happen is someone just starts attacking it and basically doing a denial of service by just publishing hashes, which are either garbage hashes or, or you know, producing blocks, which are sort of garbage blocks or are meant to confuse you whether they are garbage blocks or not um, so that no one can get their transactions through. That's another failure mode. Um, and it's good to ask, like, what are the possible responses? Obviously, Bitcoin does not have a leader, so no one can step up and say, here's what we do to respond to this attack. Um, so it might be good to ask ahead of time, well, what would we do? I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I, all right. So, Micah, I just wanted to ask about something you mentioned in the book, and that's selfish mining. Is that considered a failure mode, or is that a different type of thing? So, selfish mining—it's something. It, it's a little exploit where if one miner has thirty-three percent, and you can maybe even even start a little bit below that, um, they can. It, it's a little trick where they're they're revealing blocks at certain times. Um, they 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 mine a block, they keep it secret, and they choose when to reveal it. They can actually cause more damage to the their competition than they are causing to themselves by doing this. It's kind of a risky process hiding a block because you might end up losing it. But they're proportionally causing more damage to their competition, and so you can the way this works is if you have say thirty five percent of the hash rate, typically. Mining, honestly, you get 35% of the blocks, but if you're using selfish mining, you might get 36, 37%, something like that. And so it's a little bit of a bump. Um, and this might appear, it's just sort of like a, a you know, a quirk of, of the of the mechanism that it, it just, it works this way, but it creates kind of a, a, a an unfair competitive landscape where some of the miners can actually, are getting more for their energy than the other miners. And this causes some, uh, it causes a, a an arbitrage opportunity where they can um, buy out other miners just because they're going to get more bang for their buck, and this can snowball into a full monopoly attack. Over you know this could happen over over months or years. Um, so the question is like once if it started today, if if some you know 
two or three corporations would have like 10 to 15% of the mining hash rate. If they just started selfish mining, um, is, is something wrong? Do we, would we have to like reevaluate what we're doing? Uh, I don't know. It's another one of those questions, which I think should okay. be asked. Sure. Okay, so so I'm going to throw it over to Matthias Matthias for a minute. Matthias, you study this stuff every day, I think. Can you can you tell us what you're studying and if you're looking at this pro these types of problems with uh, selfish mining and things like that, or how people behave? Yeah, I mean, selfish mining is uh, I think is one attack that became very influential in the research community. Like people got very interested in understanding. Uh, when is it profitable? When is it not profitable? Um, I mean, one one reason people argue it actually doesn't often take place is because you actually need a big fraction of the of the hash power to actually for these attacks to be profitable. So that might be a reason that it doesn't like people. You actually don't see people doing that. Uh, another reason might be because it's actually not that obvious to detect if, if a selfish mining attack is, is happening because essentially you only see forks happening on the network, mm -hmm. um, which which is actually not uncommon. Um, so so my research, I, I look a lot on, on selfish mining uh, in uh, not only in the, in the Bitcoin context, but I also have, have looked in the context of uh, this proof of stake uh, blockchains, which are like in it, like they use very different types of constants. Uh, so in those those blockchains is actually the case that selfish mining things like selfish mining they might be profitable for any even if a miner is very small, like the, like it might be profitable to deviate from the protocol and and yeah and there's this question of like okay if, if everyone can profit by doing it why why are they not why are they not not doing that um, and and that's an interesting question. Uh, that I'm being yeah, interested in and thinking about. Um, but yeah, like centralization is like the, bit, the Bitcoin really relies on the fact that the network is not centralized because once it becomes centralized, you have this possibility of having just attacks and, and you have to be wondering, okay, what's going to happen if people are, are doing this, just playing these games that, mm -hmm. um, that, you, that you don't expect it initially. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that overview. I'm going to kind of throw it more into the geopolitical <laughs> realm, which means we're going to have to we're going to hear from Matt Pines. Matt, I'm just curious. I know you have a perspective on this. Where would an attack on Bitcoin come from, and particularly your expertise from from a corporate standpoint? Would it come from a nation state? Would it come from an individual? And what what would the consequences be of such an attack? Because I guess you study this stuff or you look at this stuff, so. Yeah, like in general, when you think about like risk assessments or threat modeling, you try to think about um, the motivations, uh, the intent and capability of a variety of set of potential threat actors. And then you think about the different methods or sort of means of attack, right? And this is not just unique to Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, like this is unique to just like any sort of cybersecurity sort of threat model analysis. And so we think about um, sort of stepping up from like, like what what you are trying to attack or what uh, what are the vulnerabilities of a system you're trying to exploit in Bitcoin, it's consensus around three things. It's consensus around uh, the, the rules of the system. It's consensus around the state of the blockchain. And it's consensus around the value of a Bitcoin. And so there are different ways you could try to attack or exploit vulnerabilities in each of those different parts of kind of the, the consensus, which is essentially ultimately a, a belief structure as Bitcoin is a socio-technical system, right? So it's interaction between human beings, their belief structure, and the instantiation of certain um, beliefs about a software protocol that everyone chooses to run because they believe other people will choose to run it. And they believe that other people won't change the version of the software uh, and the activities that they're, that, they're, that they're using that software for in the future. Uh, and so there's a sort of reinforcing set of beliefs about other people's beliefs um, and incentives about how much value they've actually put in and sort of not just beliefs, but actual investments of their personal capital, time, energy, um, and probably like, you know, some, certain emotional commitments, right? So that's like the structure of what you're talking about. And then there's different actors that might have different motivations uh, and capabilities to try to undermine different parts of that consensus. And it could come from either unintentional un or, or, or intentional actors within the, big, the Bitcoin e ecosystem themselves. And Mike has done some analysis of like certain coalitions that, that may form in the future within, say, the network of Bitcoin miners and large public corporations that have 
you know, a major equity or other investment in the Bitcoin ecosystem. It could come from other corporations that I, you know, for whatever motivation, whether they're, you know, say private banks or other financial um, um, technology firms that for whatever reason don't want Bitcoin to succeed and want to try to, you know, collude together to try to attack it. It could come from nation states or proxies of nation states. Uh, they may have different motivations, may have less sort of financially motivated reasons to attack Bitcoin or exploit Bitcoin. Um, and so this is where you try to game out what are the certain conditions under which those sorts of coalitions of those actors could form? Mm -hmm. What capabilities would they have to uh, sustain an attack or exploit vulnerabilities in the consensus uh, that keeps Bitcoin running? Um, mm -hmm. And so that is that is like, you know, the whatever $400 billion question. Um, and yeah, from the nation state level, that's often thought of as being the main, or at least um, sort of bet noir of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is often put forward as sort of anti-state money, separating money from state, sort of naturally creating this um, antagonism potentially between the nation state and and and, and wow. Bitcoin network. And so that draws a lot of the attention, I think, you know, properly. Um, but I think there's other ways that you could see the, you know, um, the endogenous incentive structure built into the Bitcoin um, network and the incentives therein uh, lead to other failure modes that are maybe not as, you know, proportionally attended to, in particular, sort of just over time, organic centralization pressures uh, that could come from within the Bitcoin um, ecosystem. Um, and yeah, the last point I'll say is like the, the world, you know, is changing um, irrespective of Bitcoin. And so one of the things I look at a lot is like, if Bitcoin succeeds over the next five or 10, 15 years, you know, at a certain point, it's going to bump up more and more against legacy institutional structures, monetary um, and geopolitical dynamics. Uh, and that is a really interesting area of exploration. So like, like the abstract, like whiteboard of what is the potential coalitions that could form and then mapping that into like what we think the actual political structures and geopolitical structures that could evolve in the next five, 10, 15 years uh, that could look to Bitcoin as a either a, an enabler of their plans and strategies or as a counter to their plans and strategies. Okay. That's a really interesting well, thing. We'll all right, we'll get back. We'll get to that in a minute. I just want to, yeah, that's out there, which is good because that's what you do. You predict the future. Um, but I'm just going to ask Bennett, Ben, I know you mentioned before to me about um, Binance and what happened. And I guess it, did Binance try to manipulate the market at all? And what? I guess that's one example we can look at. Or did they attempt to manipulate the market? <laughs> or how that's a separate question. How do you characterize that, it? I, I will leave the question as to whether or not Binance manipulated okay. the market to the CFTC okay. for now uh, and focus on in 2021 when Binance was hacked. Cheng Penzhou, the CEO of Binance, proposed rolling back the chain, basically doing a double spend attack to try to recapture the Bitcoins that had been hacked. He was quickly dissuaded from trying to pursue this path. And it's not clear that even if this had been something Binance really wanted to do, they would have been able to form the coalition or group to actually do it. But like that's one of the more recent examples of a corporation, in a sense, proposing an attack on Bitcoin. Broadly, and I think uh, both Matthew and Mike have hinted at this, like when we're talking about these attacks on Bitcoin, we have this kind of set of incentives like that Matthew was alluding to about what set this up and what's going on here. And like that kind of affects what types of attacks you would see. It is much harder for a corporation, which is going to be much more profit sensitive, that has much more of a profit motive to attack Bitcoin just because it requires so much capital to get to even 33% of hash or to form a coalition with that. Nation state attackers, like Matthew was talking about in the broader geopolitics, have a different set of incentives. They can mine at a loss. They can run attacks that are never going to make them a profit because their goal in whatever they're trying to accomplish here is not going to be about making money. It's going to be about either negatively affecting geopolitical adversaries or removing something they see as a threat to their geopolitical power. And so the spending on those things is massively larger than even like the total security spend on Bitcoin. And so you start to threaten any of those things and the attacks those attackers can bring are like of a different class than like coalitions of corporations and the like. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for straightening me out there. Um, uh, Micah, can you distinguish for us the, the different types of failure modes or attacks? Because I guess there's tech, uh, there's a technical failure mode and there's a conceptual failure mode. And what are the differences between these two types of attacks or are they different? Well, yeah, like I said, I mean, there's, you know, if you, some people will say Bitcoin failed if it's now controlled by a government or a corporation. Um, 
technically you also might say that it's continued to work if I can send a transaction and it that transaction gets confirmed and then you know you look in your Bitcoin wallet and your transaction is there. Technically that might work, um, but is it actually functioning functioning as it was designed, you know, 15 years ago? That's I think a a different question. Okay, great. Matthias, I want to direct this question particularly to you because I think you study this stuff. And if you don't, please tell me that you're not studying it and our other panelists can jump in. But just about centralization, what what do you, from, from an academic and theoretical point of view, because you're studying this stuff, to what extent do you think the chances of Bitcoin becoming, what's the chance of Bitcoin becoming centralized in the near term and the long term? And, you know, that does it's kind of a, to me, it's a, like an oxymoron because Bitcoin could be centralized, but then does, what is the chance of that happening? But then if Bitcoin becomes centralized, then what's the point of Bitcoin? Because the whole idea of Bitcoin is it's decentralized. So to me, that's a really interesting question. So can you try to attack that as I've yeah. tried to attempt to explain it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So, I mean, as, as Michael was saying, like in the beginning, it was very, I think the Nakamoto had really in mind that Bitcoin would be mined by like individual computers, like everyone would be mining Bitcoin on their house. Uh, and of course, that's what not, not what we have these days because uh, once it became so valuable, it created this incentive to design very specialized hardware. Uh, that is, that's basically the, uh, you have like ASICs there, the only purpose they were designed just to mine Bitcoin and they can do it much more efficiently than like a, like a general purpose computer. Um, so you're, so you're just not going to be profitable, uh, to mine Bitcoin with your personal computer because uh, these, these ASICs, they're just way more efficient in doing that. Uh, and, and you have seen that where now you, you basically have this very specialized, uh, farms, uh, which is like these entities that can, they're essentially the only ones that mine Bitcoin. And as, as far as we know, we don't, I guess, all the, like, we don't have like a single entity who uh, mines all the, all like the, the majority of the Bitcoin, but certainly you have um, like Bitcoin mines, they are very, like they own a very large fraction of the, of the mine power. And yeah, and that, and, and that's, we still have to see what's going to be the implication of that, but there's definitely this economic uh, incentive to centralize because you're essentially uh, forced to, to design more efficient hardware. Uh, and that, and, and there, that would be like the worst failure mode, right? If someone can control more than 50% of the Bitcoin mining or, uh, or the mining hashes, then it's very easy for them to uh, reverse transactions, for example, like mm -hmm. as we are saying, like Binance, like if they if they control more than fifty percent of the mining power, it's just very easy for them to reverse a transaction, um, and and then yeah, well you might be asked, okay, what's the point of this system now, right? If anyone can just decide to erase a transaction from the blockchain, wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. So so Ben, you had mentioned before, I thought what what I, this is just a more of a theoretical question but at what point does does this happen is it a 50 percent that someone controls bitcoin or is it 33 percent or what what percentage of the hash do they have to recover matthias you said it's probably 50 it might be 50 percent ben it's, is ben what do you think what, what well, is, it, it it's probabilistic right like mike <laughs> Like Micah mentioned when he was talking about selfish mining, once you get to 33%, you have a competitive advantage that helps you accumulate more hash okay. oh. and eventually get to 51% where you can more easily do like oh, okay. censoring oh, okay. attacks and double spending attacks and things like that. And so 33 is where you gain like a competitive advantage. Oh, okay. 51 is where you like oh, wow. are. Yeah, like 51, is, yeah 51, 51 is essentially you can erase anything you want. Like, but where be below that, you essentially have some advantage. But once you reach fifty one percent, you can you can do whatever you want. And that's what yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay, Micah, back to you for a second, if you will. We've talked about all these different types of attacks and how things happen. What if if you took a perfect model of game theory? What what could you what could you what could you predict? 
what do you think you could predict? I mean, for <laughs> we don't know. Is that well? I mean, there's there's no such thing. I mean, game theory, game theory usually deals in solution concepts, um, which are all the possible things that might be reasonable according to some set of criteria. So um, there's lots of outcomes that could possibly happen, um, and game theorists will say that some are more likely than others, but it's really hard to predict because it's you know you're talking about you know how people behave in the future and that right. you have to know what people believe about other people believe and you know like Matthew was saying it's beliefs about beliefs and not everybody knows exactly what everybody else believes so it's it's really unpredictable and really chaotic okay. and I think uh, Bitcoin sort of the perfect storm of that where you really have a lot of people um, trying to guess what other people are believing I guess I guess my ultimate question is are people in the this is an interesting question. Are people in the Bitcoin universe or those that mine Bitcoin using sophisticated game theory analytics to predict what will happen? At the moment, I don't believe so. I think like the miners just going, I'm just going to keep mining Bitcoin. And the and the, the people that are stacking are just going to say, I'm going to keep stacking Bitcoin. And because they're also, I mean, they in a sense they are, they're using a very simple game theory. The game theory says, I believe that more people in the future are going to want Bitcoin, therefore I'm buying Bitcoin now. Um, that's a very simple uh, proposition. Sure. If I just believe the number is going to go up forever, then it's always in my incentive to, to buy more. Or right. to I'm going to get, get back to that in a second, but I just wanted to, <clears throat> Matthew Pines, I just would throw it back to you. Do you think that institutes, <laughs> institutions or governments could really game this out using game theory analysis and have a competitive advantage and predict what's going to happen or so certainly you can do, use things like backwards induction right but as mike mentioned right like fundamentally um these are intractable human systems right you can't be perfectly modeled like an engineering system where it's like a closed loop and you're solving for some linear equation right it is a like human human beings are unpredictable right we we sometimes res we respond to incentives for the most part but we're also not perfectly rational bayesian creatures right um and people that run Bitcoin mining companies are the same heads of heads of countries are 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 are, are, are similar. Um, and the interesting thing about the Bitcoin mining kind of industry, because it's a subset of the overall kind of Bitcoin um, incentive structure, but it's like a, it's a critical one, is they do you know reason about what they think other uh, miners are likely to do in response to say like the having event. And you can do lots of Bitcoin mining is a very weird industry in the sense that like the product of these companies is undifferentiated, right? It's like a, they all make, they all, you know, make the same hash, right? And they're all bidding in a perfectly competitive auction globally. What they really compete on is operational efficiency. So CapEx, CapEx and OpEx, essentially cost of their operations, cost of their input energy and the efficiency of their mining machines. Um, and whether they have, you know, vertically integrated operations, right? To be able to try to squeeze as much, um, you know, essentially, you know, like uh, like cost per, uh, per terahash. And, Every as 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 uh, Bennett mentioned, every four years, basically like the the block reward cuts by half, and so that's like a that's a very weird industry where essentially like there's like an overnight shift in like the amount of revenue, like holding the price of Bitcoin constant that every Bitcoin uh, miner in the world faces, and so there's a pretty radical change in like the basic economic structure of Bitcoin mining that that coincides with these happening events, and so Bitcoin miners. Like they, they, they're strategic players. And so they try to position against those future events, but also the cost of capital, their machines, mm -hmm. where around the world they can plug these machines in to get the most um, essentially cost efficient basis for their operations. And so it is a very weird and somewhat um, non-traditional sort of uh, uh, you know, economic game that they're all playing against each other. Mm -hmm. But that's just like the day-to-day -day game. Um, the coalitional incentives to say like attack the network I mean, that's a separate thing that I'm sure they don't want to talk about because it's sort of socially um, you get, you know, you wouldn't be welcome at Bitcoin mining conferences if you were like talking publicly as a Bitcoin miner about how you could collude to attack the Bitcoin no, blockchain, no. right? It just wouldn't get you invited to those happy hours, right? Um, which is itself, I think, a strong, enduring, like I wouldn't sneeze at that because that is in itself an, a, an important mechanism by which right now the Bitcoin kind of meta layer of consensus is that you don't do this, right? And so there's like implicit barriers to that sort of coalition forming, um, you know, that, that could change over time, right? But a large part of this is like, you know, creating that 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 superstructure of belief and that superstructure of meta belief about other Bitcoin beliefs that includes the, you know, what is, you know, socially not okay to, to talk about and to sort of plan mm -hmm. and also you can do it really covertly, which is 
hard to do. Wow, well, thank you. That was interesting. Um, Micah, can you talk a little, you, you mentioned in the book, I guess, I guess I'll pronounce this wrong, but about market fragility. Did I say that right? Market yeah. fragility hypothesis. Can you talk about that? I, I don't know. The term itself just fascinates me. I don't know if I'll be that excited about if you tell me after you explain what it is, but go ahead. It's so. Yeah. Well, so for a long time, it's been sort of assumed that, you know, this, and this was true in the very early days of Bitcoin, that if someone decided to take over the network and monopolize it, and you know, do a big double spin or start centering the transactions, that that would be the end of the experiment, that everybody would go home and Bitcoin was fun and, and, and the game is over now, um, now that somebody took it over. In fact, this is, if you go back and look at the early post, that's explicitly what they said, is that if, if somebody comes in and, and monopolize it, then it was a fun experiment. Um, but that was like you know, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, now it's a different question because when if you listen to people who are, advocating for Bitcoin and all its different use cases, they're not, all these use cases, it's not 100% clear if they rely on it being a completely decentralized currency. A lot of talk about Bitcoin is it's a hedge against a, inflation. It's, um, you know, it's good for cross-border payments. You know, you're, you're saving, you're, it's competitively better than Western Union or something, right? This still might be true, regardless of whether, you know, uh, Wells Fargo and Amazon have teamed up to process the payments. Um, they just might do this because they, you know, it's it's uh, more efficient if they do it this way. So the market fragility hypothesis is this notion, this idea that immediately once this centralization happens, everybody will sell their Bitcoin and the market value will crash. Right. And this was, I think, it was part of the dogma for many years, and I, I'm, I've been starting to question it just because I've heard so many. Uh, so many advocates claim things about Bitcoin that do not necessarily tie back to the decentralization. That's right. Okay. Well, and if I, if I can just add in, like what Mike is talking about there and kind of getting at is in all of these attacks, the way out for Bitcoin is always to go back to layer zero and change whatever aspect of the protocol is being attacked. Right? Like if some entity is able to gain a majority of hash rate, it is possible for, the group of people who care about Bitcoin minus that entity to agree that they want to now call something on a different consensus algorithm Bitcoin. And then by virtue of everyone agreeing that that new thing is Bitcoin, they'll be on that Bitcoin and the attacker will be on the old Bitcoin. And so like what this hypothesis is getting at is how likely is it that you see that defection? Like at what point do people actually leave the thing that we have up until now called Bitcoin? Wow. That was I don't know. Well, I guess that's the next one of the next questions. Um, I guess one of my next questions is, well, we'll get to, at the end, I want to ask what the future holds for Bitcoin, but let's hold off on that for a minute. We talked a lot about, about entities controlling the hash or control. What happens if, can, this, can an entity control the supply chain of Bitcoin? Like, could an entity control the hardware, what you need to mine Bitcoin? Could an entity such as a nation state control the energy? I mean, could a, a Bennett's, I don't know, laughing, but we'll have to see what he has to say. Um, and what what were the chances of some entity controlling? Like if, you, if, if one entity has a monopolization on the energy that's needed to, con, to, to mine Bitcoin, that'll put other people, other entities at, dis, at a disadvantage. And I guess, could that happen? Then it do your, your, sure, your, I'll jump in. Okay. Uh, well, you wanted I, to, I thought you wanted to. So go I, ahead. I, I was smiling a little bit there because um, <laughs> during the block size war, when Bitcoin cash forked off from Bitcoin, and when there was this major reckoning in the Bitcoin community about what is Bitcoin and what does it look like, Bitmain was the primary supplier of ASICs, the machines used to mine Bitcoin. Right. And they had a lot of opinions on what the future of Bitcoin should look like. And so like a lot of the dynamics surrounding that, like from the New York agreement at Consensus 2017, where a bunch of companies came together and agreed on what they all thought was going to be the future for Bitcoin scaling with SegWit 2X, right? Which was adding in the segregated witness change and also doubling the block size. Um, and so that was kind of the expectation, but then the reality was that the Bitcoin community more broadly did not want to run, 
did not want to increase the block size, saw issues with increasing the block size, and saw issues with that agreement as like a philosophical idea. And so SegWit 2X was never activated. And when SegWit itself was activated, it was by it was once a large enough number of users running nodes reported that they were ready for the activation of SegWit. And so like I, I was chuckling when you were saying it because we've kind of had an example of this attempt by Bitmain of the producer of the mining hardware to exert this pretty meaningful influence over Bitcoin and kind of saw examples of some of the steps Bitcoin, the community takes to respond to that kind of thing. Hmm. Okay. The other thing I'll, I'll add in because yeah. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the geopolitics of semiconductors, which is obviously, you know, oh, wow. Yeah. Sure. Out, you I know, know like, back better, all that stuff. Yeah. Like Taiwan is being basically the, the monopoly, uh, you know, uh, manufacturer of leading edge, um, semiconductors, right? They have right now like captured most of the market and they have the, the most advanced R and D when it comes to producing the most powerful chips basically. Right. Um, and the big supply chain is, is very, um, complex, but they are like one of those choke points. The reason why everyone's so fraught, uh, about the risk of us a, a Taiwan war. Um, <clears throat> but the reason why this matters is semiconductors are becoming like, like the focus of a lot of attention, not just because of the geopolitical issues, but it, um, it's also uh, motivating a, um, an expansion of the United States' approach to export controls and regulatory regimes around uh, that whole like industry. And you've even seen things uh, related to like regulation impulses coming out of uh, um, fear over AI, uh, leading to expansion of like KYC, know your customer rules, potentially to GPU production, right? So that you have to know who you're exporting GPUs to, right? To make sure that it's not someone that's like upstream uh, uh, of, of some Chinese state-owned enterprise, right? Or some some other company in China that we don't want to get access to the, the, those leading edge chips. So you can imagine in a few years, if we put in place a regime that essentially expands what, what are right now kind of the extra extraterritoriality of our financial surveillance network, right? Know your customer for banking relationships. We expand that to the computing supply chain. And now every producer and exporter of these um, advanced chips uh, has to certainly know their customer. Um, you, I, I would see that being a potential threat vector for Bitcoin, right? Because that is a, right now, roughly every three to five years, you know, Bitcoin miners have to refresh um, their their machines, right? They can, you know, have good maintenance on them. They can just extend the lifetime. Um, and often, I think, you know, Moore's law may or may not like mm -hmm. keep up, yeah. right? Um, but fundamentally, like that is a that is a critical sort of input to uh, this this race, right? And for last for most of Bitcoin's history, we've sort of been in this regime where the global production and uh, advancements in, in semiconductors have just sort of proceeded smoothly. And so the Bitcoin mining industry was able to sort of take that as a, as just like um, uh, a given. Uh, and that may not be a given in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and there could be additional regimes of surveillance and control, which is how you, how you have network power. Network power is surveillance and choke point, right? That's what the current uh, sort of global monetary system is. It's global um, uh, surveillance using sort of FinCEN and Bank Secrecy Act reporting. And it's choke point using OFAC and secondary sanctions. And that is probably the most powerful instrument of US global power right now that we wield very effectively, um, sometimes too much and it blows back in our face, but it's a separate conversation. But you're seeing already talk about how motivated by China competition and fears over semiconductors as well as AI, expanding that regime to the computing um, uh, supply chain. And that that is a regime that you could see Bitcoin kind of being locked in both, right? Mm -hmm. Both the financial, uh, side of things as well as the computing side of things. And it is sort of starting to sprout up in, in the middle of both of those regimes. So I'm, I'm focused on that in the next you know, wow. five or 10 years. Well, I, I mean, this is another conversation. I'm sure our, what I was going to say, but I'm sure our, our, our panels will be interested in knowing about the, I'm just going to throw this out there just for controversial purposes about the deep state and how the deep state might try to control Bitcoin, but we'll, we'll get to that on, at another point. I guess the other question I have is and Matt, Matt Pine, you mentioned this um, when we in a previous discussion that we had individually. But um, to what extent? Because um, and and you mentioned about um, the social consensus, and I guess uh, what is it, layer zero, Bennett? You you talked about that. What are the chances of an entity trying to manipulate Bitcoin? And this is something I don't think we've talked about by using information warfare or trying to change okay. the consensus by 
you know, information more? Yeah. I'll, I'll give my quick take and I'm sure other folks okay. like, but like oh, sure. bottom line is we're very concerned just as a, as a society about, you know, how do we reconcile, um, you know, the, the sort of fragmentation of belief, right? That uh, social media and now generative AI could potentially pose to like consensus on not just the state of blockchain or the rules around Bitcoin, but, you know, the results of elections, uh, you know, valid um, arguments over, you know, science policy, right? Like, we already have very difficult uh, um, disagreements that are going to be um, uh, accelerated in their divergence by the application of potentially these essentially AI bots that can be really sophisticated in their ability to um, weaponize disinformation, uh, fracture uh, kind of group uh, consensus, sort of pit groups against each other. Like lots of states are investing these capabilities at scale to undermine each other's societies um, as a tool of statecraft and sort of asymmetric warfare against each other's societies. Um, and those tools are getting much better very fast. And so you can imagine, you know, a lot of the sort of layer zero is formed on social media is reinforced over, over social media. So that would be a, a, a prime, you know, a ground to, to try to, you know, uh, manipulate that consensus formation and do that maybe in concert with some of these other attacks, right? To sort of get a synergistic effect. Um, and I'm sure Bennett has thoughts on that too. Well, yeah, that was the point I, I was going to make right after yours is that if layer zero is the out, if going to social consensus and changing what we all agree on in Bitcoin is like the last ditch option against most attacks, making it harder to use that means that it is far harder for whatever the Bitcoin community is to coordinate, organize, end up on a different consensus algorithm, on a different version of the client, appropriately ignoring attackers, whatever. And so it makes all of your attacks more powerful if you're able to successfully like uh, if you're able to successfully make it so the Bitcoin community cannot effectively coordinate or agree. Yeah. One of the last questions I was going to ask, but and I, I'll, I'll just ask this, what does the future of Bitcoin hold? But I guess, I don't know, we could have 10 different answers. And if we knew, we'd all be billionaires now. So, but but why don't we just go around? I mean, just, just quickly go around the panelists and we're going to get to the questions because we've got some really great questions. And thank you for... For, for sharing those questions with us and we'll get to them in a minute. But just to go around the panel, Michael, why don't, why don't we start with you? What is, can you, just for, to kind of summarize, what do you think the future of Bitcoin is? And then let's go the next five, 20, 50 years out there. Oh gosh, I mean, I mean I, then, I, I, then I, it will be around in 50 years, I'll be long gone, but anyway. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ways it could go forward. Um, like, so I do think there's going to be some sort of security phase shift in the next 10 to 15 years where these parameters change um, and people kind of come to a different understanding of how this needs to work. Obviously the number can't keep going up exponentially forever. That's not possible, um, you know, except for it's, it's a very small exponential rate. Um, so eventually the, you know, the markets are gonna mature where, you, you know, your, your markets for ASICs is gonna make it very competitive for mining. So the, the, the miners are gonna have a lot of competitive pressures. Um, so at some point in the next, yeah, like 10, 15 years, there's gonna be some sort of change. And I think in, in the way that the people view it and what it's used for. And it could just be that it keeps working kind of like a number where it is now. Um, and nobody really, people might, shut up about it going to to 10 billion dollars at some point this will probably happen people will stop claiming it's going to take all the all the earth's value and it might occasionally um you know have a spike where it goes from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars one day and we find out later something happened um that's one option i don't think i mean that's kind of like maybe more than likely that it just kind of doesn't really do anything crazy spectacular um but then there you know i i think it could eventually at some point be sort of soft centralized or sort of captured yeah. where it's just um nobody will do anything really crazy with it because they know that if someone did anything really crazy with it then that would uh you know they they would probably get caught like you know maybe people will will do small time things, you know, things they don't want to get censored for, um, okay. which is fine. Uh, but you you won't have like, uh, you know, the Iranian government transacting with North Korea, you know, tens of billions of dollars, 
you know, thumbing the nose at the U.S. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. Um, okay, but Matthias, you study this stuff, don't you? So, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yeah, I think I think they like there. There's definitely interesting aspects about the security questions. I mean, for example, I mean, even though this like this block uh, rewards they you they divide in half every four years, and you only reach zero in in a hundred years. I mean, it's also the question, okay, if, if that you're essentially dividing the security budget in half every four years, it doesn't mean you need to reach zero to actually have a security problem, right? You're you're always reducing how much you're incentivizing the security of the network. So maybe the next four years, that's already, you might reach a, a threshold where people don't want to mine and secure the network anymore. Or like maybe in eight years, you don't know. It doesn't need to be a hundred years. Um, uh, so that's an interesting question, like how you're, how you're gonna cope with that, um, and and, the, and there's often like this question, this, this argument. Well, people think just because you're dividing the security budget in, in half, that the price of Bitcoin is gonna double. I mean, that's kind of, I don't know, like where that's coming from. But um, yeah, so there's like interesting questions uh, around security. Um, and I think there's an interest, I think Bennett was like talking about interesting aspect of about layer, layer zero, like, like when, how you reach like social consensus if, if something goes wrong. Uh, you could imagine things like, uh, how can you like, um, I mean, one, one, one way that Bitcoin is actually interesting around Bitcoin is that you use particular hash functions. And so that's the reason why it's not easy to actually use the same hardware to mine different cryptocurrencies. Um, so there, there's just interesting aspects about the hardware itself that makes it mm -hmm. uh, hard to manipulate the, 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 the mining of the network. Um, so I think these are all like interesting questions. I'm, I'm very interested on, on the protocol design level, how you can change the protocols, how you can uh, design these protocols in a way that, that they'll make them more robust uh, to the long term, I think that's an interesting direction. Thanks, Bennett. You you had a little yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, <laughs> you can tell what Bennett's going to say <clears throat> because he he gets a little smile. I, yeah, I I was just chuckling because no, we we do know some of the traders who have propagated the it needs to double every four years okay. thing. It's basically a law, and I, it's not worth naming them here, but. Just to get back to the like actual question, I think I agree with um, Micah that at some point in the future, there's going to be shifts in how Bitcoin is thought about. Like the current set of parameters means to maintain the same amount of security spend we have now. Not talking about increasing it or anything else. We're going to need like the average transaction fee paid, or the yeah the transaction fees paid to meaningfully go up. And so that really kind of changes what Bitcoin is for. So as those transaction fees go up, as a lot of certain types of activity gets priced out of the market, do we reach a point like where Micah is talking about where it becomes co-opted by corporations, by Wall Street, by the state into some neutered version of the original vision of Bitcoin, but one that's acceptable enough for many people who see it as an, a gold-like asset they can put money into to hold Bitcoin. But like, Obviously, some portion of the Bitcoin community is not going to be okay with that and is going to continue and to create something that they believe is the real Bitcoin. And like, I think that that's really the risk for the next hundred years of Bitcoin is that there are certain things that the community believes is set in stone that very likely may need to change in order for Bitcoin to continue. Like I've pointed towards the 21 million cap before and suggested that I think for Bitcoin to have a life beyond that, eventually there's going to be tail emissions beyond the 21 million in order to help continue securing Bitcoin. But that's an extraordinarily contentious statement. And even if like you get to a point where that seems like it should be extraordinary, extraordinarily clear to the people in the community, there's going to be a portion of it who absolutely refuse to consider that, right? That is going to be a contentious hard fork. If you want to reduce the average fee paid, you need to increase the block size, right? But in doing probably you probably need to reduce the block size or find other ways to move that to 
other layers, et cetera. But it, even in many of those, you still need the ability to sometimes transact on layer one. And so then you're reducing the number of people who can validate the network. And that's been a historically contentious issue in Bitcoin. And if you don't do that, then you're kind of reducing the types of activity that Bitcoin can be used for by making it so that if people want to use it in the stated like trustless censorship resistant way, they need to have a certain amount of capital already available to enter into that system or else they're being pushed into layers where they have more of this trust that Bitcoin was originally meant to obviate. And so I think like the fundamental crisis for Bitcoin that it faces is that the community has believed that certain aspects of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin are already ossified, are set in stone and cannot be changed. And if that is true, there are like a series of different potential crises that face that conception of what Bitcoin is over the next several decades. Wow. Okay. That summarizes nicely. <laughs> so Matt Pines, do you have anything to add there or you're yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's it's really interesting. Like Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoiners are fond of saying like Bitcoin fosters long term thinking. It also fosters long term paranoia, right? But it's like it's <laughs> funny, like because of the nature of the protocol, because the issuance schedule is so fixed, you can have like these debates, which are like, okay, anchor your assumptions on a certain way of we think the next five, 10, 50 years are going to play out. Because we know the issuance schedule is fixed, you can sort of, okay, well, then the security budget has to be X in order for us not to fall below some threshold, right? Um I mean, I like I think was it Yogi Bear, right? Prediction is hard, especially about the future, right? Like I just look at like all of human society and I'm like, where would I feel comfortable making predictions about the stability of like any human system by 2050? And I struggle. Um, I look at just like the US as the global hegemon, like all things being equal, just with our current sort of fiscal projections, the largest single program, the largest single expenditure in the federal budget is going to be interest expense um, by 2050. Um, so that's like, that would break the current system, right, of sort of political economy, taxation, just basic model of, of, of um, social contract that we have. So like, that's that's a looming crisis that we're aware of. You know, if you're um, if you're uh, an environmentalist, you look at climate change. You're like, oh, okay, we're we're facing deadlines for net zero. We have to fundamentally transform our our energy system. We have all these geopolitical frictions. China has set a target of 2049 where they're going to have essentially like national um, rejuvenation, which basically says they're going to have Taiwan as part of as part of um, uh, like you know a, a their governance system. So like, if we're trying to like zoom out and be like, just Bitcoin, okay, like have faced this crisis, like almost every human system is going to face some form of like potential existential crisis between now and, you know, 2050. Um, so like, I'm not, just because I'm like, I don't know, like I, I like looking at Bitcoin, but I'm also like, okay, well, is there a safer bet that I'm going to put all my chips in, right? Like, I think it's, it's interesting to see how Bitcoin, if it starts to become involved in these larger um, conversations and larger uh, kind of monetary and geopolitical dynamics, um, a lot more attention is going to be paid to, okay, what are the inherent fragilities or instabilities and incentive, um, you know, mismatches inside Bitcoin? And where I think Michael lays out some of those scenarios are really interesting, right? It's like, it may not be this like hyperbolic, you know, failure or, you know, to the moon scenario. It could be this sort of meandering, soft capture, you know, accommodation, sort of middle middle ground where, you know, human beings... Right. You know, make make compromises all the time, um, and and it could flip. Um, but honestly, there's so many contingencies involved in planning the scenarios out with like <clears throat> underlying like infrastructure that goes into mining, like changes of of like a, of, of a computational paradigm, right? We like invent a new form of computing, like okay, like what does that mean, right? Um, if we uh, unlock a new energy source. Right. And now, like, we've got lots of cheap free energy that's not as geographically contingent as wind farms, solar farms, fossil fuel, et cetera. That changes the distribution of, of Bitcoin mining and potential, you know, centralization pressures. And there's lots of other political dynamics, like political evolution of the dominant regulatory regimes on, on Earth right now and sort of the G7 alignment of sort of Western liberal powers, you know, basically are the ones that are underpinning this sort of um, global regimes of regulation that are, you know, the principal capture uh, vector for Bitcoin. Uh, and the associated kind of you know pools of capital that they can influence and you know control by proxy, you know those could degrade over time. And so like there's lots of scenarios <laughs> that that I think about that are like on this wide spectrum. Um, and I just I, I just don't make predictions at the end of the day. Right? No, and this is actually, yeah, You're this is why the price mean. is what it is, right? If all that was like fully baked in, right, there'd be you know wow. there'd be no uh, risk um, associated with that. That's why. Yeah, who knows? We could have cold fusion, and that would solve all the energy problems. All right, anyway, <laughs> I'd love that. You know.
that would be much better. Anyway, so we do. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So we just some great questions here. And Patricia, I don't, our participants, mm -hmm. our, our, the folks on the call the, on the webinar participants can't see the questions. So why don't I read out the, can I, should I read out the questions and then the panelists can address them? Why don't we do that? Will that work? We can do that. Um, I could also read them out if you prefer. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead? I need a, I need a rest. All right. <laughs> well, thank you Not for, Thanks. Thank you for a lively discussion. I mean, it it really is interesting to um, see what the future of Bitcoin could potentially hold, although nobody wants to make, you know, it seems like making predictions is not always like the safest bet, but still very much appreciated. Um, now, I wanted to go to the comments over here and see that uh, uh, the trans. OK, so I think, uh, Bennett, did you write this? Um... No, Bennett didn't write that. Nope. I don't think so. okay. I All right, either. got it. All right. Want me to just read right. it? You can go ahead if you want. All right. So just making sure that, okay, this is a, one of the participants said, transaction uh, reversibility in the case of 51% attack. Yes, you can only double spend the transactions you have signed with your private keys, right? You cannot get the other's Bitcoins as they are protected by cryptography, not POW. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But right. you can still reverse the other transactions, right? You can create an alternate history with like a bunch of fake, like a bunch of empty blocks and have that be the new heaviest chain. So you can make the transactions never have happened, but you can't like add, you can't transact other people's Bitcoins. Yeah. yeah. And you, and I, yeah. And essentially you also, I mean, if someone, if someone could also censor your Bitcoin, right? Like if you're, you say, okay, you still have your, your Bitcoin, you're trying to send it to someone. Well, if that person has 51% mm -hmm. of the hash power, essentially, they are not going to allow, they might not allow you to use it. So it, it, it's essentially like you don't have it if you can't include your a transaction, transferring your Bitcoin to someone else. Um, so yeah, so the crypto ensure you, you still have it, but if you can't include it in the blockchain, then it's as, it. as good as, as good as nothing. Right? Well, well, you can meet, the you can meet up in the parking lot and just you know give them the the, the you know <laughs> you can do the uh, the IRL transaction. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, now we have. I'll make it. Go ahead. Say some guy. Um, yeah, go ahead. So I mean, this is it's interesting. So like, I think what what Bennett what Bennett was saying is like, if you have enough hash power, you could literally go back to block two and start binding blocks and erase the chain um, from block two, creating your new chain, and you can then all own all the Bitcoins. Um, this is theoretically possible, but it's also one of those attacks that, you know, according to technically, this, this would make every Bitcoin yours, but then nobody in the world would be using this chain because nobody wants to use this chain that only you have the Bitcoins, except for maybe 100 that Satoshi has. Um, and, you know, and doesn't core like soft checkpoint now too like doesn't it check certain blocks to see if like their hash matches with what it expects for ones that are old enough and so you end up with issues like where in theory that can work but i think in like the most common implementations of client software you would still end up failing with that yeah so most of the bitcoins would not be um stealable i mean in the last like 90 percent roughly we've produced i think mm -hmm. um so a few months back, you might be able to mine or a few months back and only the Bitcoins that have been created in the last few months of Bitcoins, you would be able to, um, you know, reissue to yourself. Mm. There are more, there's like a really heavy handed attack, um, which might allow you to take someone's Bitcoin um, without their keys. And that's, it's, it's extremely heavy handed and it's probably not likely to work. Um, and that's, if you have so much hash rate, that you start mining a chain that only that just kind of just forces that just allows that just declares um, your your private key is able to spin somebody else's key like it breaks all the rules. Um, you could force this and just say I'm doing this, and then the heavy hand part of this is you then direct all of your hash rate to destroy any other version of Bitcoin which might actually follow the rules. Um, it's it's sort of unlikely, but this is it's a like a sixty seven percent attack in that you're right. you're taking half of your hash rate and you're using it to destroy any actual Bitcoin, making the only Bitcoin that works a sort of perverted Bitcoin that you run. Um, but other than that, yes, you cannot do anything without the uh, the cryptographic keys. Okay. 
Okay, got it. Got it. Thank you for Actually, that answer. Next, yeah, go ahead. We're getting a lot of yeah. questions here. We're getting a lot of questions. This you want is me great. To read or you want to read oh, sure. You can you can read the next one, Steve, All if right, you'd sure. like. Given the having schedule, doubling the cost of production every four years and mining difficulty, scaling production costs along with participate along with participation, doesn't Bitcoin game theory amount to get in this is interesting. Get in yeah. get in early so you can profit, as per Nakamoto in February of 2009. And then there's the the uh, the quote from uh, Nakamoto there. So, which would you which like is, me to which read? I can the read, quote? I guess. Okay. As the number of users grows, the value per coin increases. It has the potential for a positive feedback loop. As users increase, the value goes up, which could attract more users to take advantage of the increasing value. Any comments on that? I mean, is is that? Yeah, I I, I mean, in a sense, the having schedule halves the cost like halves the energy spend denominated in bitcoin every four years it's not doubling it because like the amount of new bitcoin being issued are going down by half and like in most theories of bitcoin i think there is like a belief that there is some amount of network effect where the more users who are able to use bitcoin the better for bitcoin um and so that results in potentially more value for Bitcoin. Uh, and there is the dynamic where you used to get 50 Bitcoins per block and now you get six and a quarter. I think it's six and a quarter uh, per block. And so like, yeah, you get a lot less if you're mining Bitcoin now and you're investing a lot more energy to get it. But each Bitcoin was also worth way less back then, right? And there was a lot more open, it was a lot easier for Bitcoin to fail at certain points in the past too. And so like, yeah, the there's a lot of early accumulators of Bitcoin who have disproportionately large sums of it. Got it. All right. We have another. Um, all right. This is um, more of a comment. Oh, well, this is actually a quote from Satoshi that um, somebody submitted. Uh, Steve, uh, do you ahead. think I've... Oh, yeah, okay. so I, this relates, so sorry, just to interject, I think this relates to the original question we were uh, answering about like transaction reversibility in like, this is talking about how taking over the network, you generally can't reverse most transactions unless you control the keys. So I think this quote relates to that original question. Okay, got it. Address that, I guess, okay. All right, then shall we move on to um, yeah. the next? Yeah. All right, so this one uh, is a question and it says, isn't the price of Bitcoin already manipulated with information warfare? Uh, last I checked, the price of tokens in crypto is heavily manipulated. <laughs> that you're kind of like smirking there. There is an actual liquid market in Bitcoin, right? It is possible to buy and sell pretty large quantities of Bitcoin today if you wanted. And so there's real money being transacted right now for Bitcoin buying and selling. Mm -hmm. There's someone on the other side of those trades doing the other thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the key thing to me is like, you can like price in markets is subject to uh, lots of inputs, right? Which are which people have insider information. They try to trade on that in all sorts of markets. Um, that you know, you try to m mitigate that as much as possible. Is why you have like you know regulated markets. You try to ensure there isn't someone with you know disadvantaged position trading and exploiting that information against other people in the market. But that's like a general <laughs> failure mode for almost any market. Um, is is asymmetric information? Market makers exploiting, you know, um, you know, like the order book, et cetera, front running, all that sort of stuff. Um, the part of information warfare that's like we're talking about is like is is attacking the social consensus, like for the purposes of actually degrading the usefulness of the blockchain itself, and not that just hasn't being, happened yet. Um, I mean. Per not, not that we're aware of, right? I guess you could okay, imagine. Well, we, well, someone, someone first, get it tested I, it, and they've like done some, you know, covert tests, uh, and you know, subtly tried to see what they could influence. But I don't I mean, know. I, the, there yeah. definitely are um, lots of. I mean, it seems like bot farms on Twitter, which are intent on either uh, degrading or um, advocating for different currencies. Uh, like I get, you know. If you go out on on social media, you get attacked by a lot of these people that are, want to tell you that this is this Bitcoin is is garbage and try this other cryptocurrency which is going to work. 
Um, you also have people that are, you know, promoting Dogecoin and decide to like buy the largest social network in the world. Um, and, you know, that could be a form of information oh, war yeah, warfare, exactly. which you, you know, might okay. try to profit from. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. So we still have more questions coming in. So I'll just read it. Um, think about 51% from a game theoretic perspective. And what kind of reality is this kind of highly coordinated attack? And what kind of reality is this kind of highly coordinated attack uh, might happen? Likely to happen, yeah. Likely to happen. It's true that any any government can conjure any amount of debt tokens to finance this, but it is unlikely. I, I think that's a statement, but does anybody have anything to yeah. say? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, imagine the price stabilizes and the mining market stabilizes. Um, you could have a situation where you have, you know, say 10 miners, say have 10%. I mean, they could sort of, uh, you know, partially centralized. They all could be making very, very small amount of profit. You know, they're, they're spending each a billion dollars a year. They're getting $1.1 billion in profit or in, in revenue. Um, they're making small amount of profit. They could look at each other and say, okay, if five or six of us, or maybe four of us, if we're, you know, just interested in selfish mining, if we colluded, um, we would be getting 100% of the profit for 50% of the cost, basically. So your, your profit margins would jump from, you know, a, a, a small, narrow, you know, 10% or something to, to possibly, you know, a, a huge multiple of that. Um, and is, if you don't assume the market fragility hypothesis, then you are, this is just an arbitrage opportunity, which is sitting there for any collusive group of miners to take. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and read the next question because the questions keep coming in, which is fine. Okay. What do the panelists think about Bitcoin mining being supported by influence inflows of fiat li liquidity? Hash rate is supported by miners who have to pay bills in fiat, F-I-A-T, and minor, and minor cash flow is based on their ability to sell Bitcoin. I haven't heard discussion around the hash rate collapse. Wow precipitated by a fiat liquidity crisis among miners. Do you, wow, this is a long one. Do you feel that public investment in Bitcoin will continue to support the existing future hash rate? Wow. That's uh, I'll go my first take on this. So we kind of saw a version of this in the past 12 months uh, where, you know, there was a very strong dollar at the same time there was a, a, um, a crash in, in, in Bitcoin prices um, and also a rise in, like the fully levelized cost of energy. Um, and so for the miners that hadn't either hedged their energy costs, had taken out lots of debt, now found themselves having to service um, expensive debt uh, with rising costs and a lower Bitcoin price. Um, and so they were selling, like the Bitcoin, you know, most miners were just net sellers of Bitcoin to generate fiat liquidity, to pay off their debts, to keep their operations running. A lot of them weren't able to do that. A lot of them went bankrupt. Um, some of the bigger ones, including like Core Scientific, um, went bankrupt. Um, and so this, you know, like like any market, right? You're subject to shocks, and the ones that hedge those risks, that are better positioned, have let you know more diversification, lower costs, they survive. The ones that don't, you know, die. And this is like it's a very competitive market. Um, the last part, like, do you feel public investment in Bitcoin? I'm not sure. What that refers to is if like government investment in Bitcoin, um, which ha which is happening. I mean, we've heard just in the past few months, um, either nation states or nation state proxies and small um, are getting are, are are mining. I think um, uh, the state of uh, of um, Nepal has like announced like a five hundred million dollar investment into mining, wow. like a big like hydro plant. Um, I think uh, Marathon just in announced a. I figured a 250 megawatt project in um, Abu Dhabi, where like a like you know state affiliated entity is like going to own 80 percent of this um, of this uh, of this very large mining facility there. Um, I think it take advantage of the fact that they they have way too much energy pr to produce you know like air conditioning in the summer and that they don't need all that energy uh, in the winter and so they'll have this like immersion cooled massive facility. Um, that's I think you know. Some of it's funded by like a state sovereign wealth fund or affiliated with the with the government there. Um, so you could see these interesting dance play where like there's large, large pools of capital that are often coming out of the, like like GCC countries, um, a lot of them, 
um, that the Gulf Cooper Cooperation Council said, like 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 Middle Eastern um, countries that have a lot of capital that were recycling those those dollars into like Western equity markets and Western debts that may slice off a piece of it uh, and invest it into domestic Bitcoin mining potentially. Um, you know, at least you're seeing hints of that potentially. We got some great questions here, so I'm just going to keep, we'll just keep okay. Yeah, um, I just want to be mindful of the time. We have 15 minutes left, so we may not okay. be able to get to all the questions. These are all really nice questions, but we'll read through as many as uh, possible. All right, I'll just keep going. All right, that, all right, so here's another question or a comment, kind of a question. The, ha the, ha the halving reduces the supply of Bitcoin coming into the market. Reduce selling pressures and supply and increasing demand leads to a high probability that price will continue to increase. If that is not the case, then how do we explain the effect of having on the price in Bitcoin history? If you so, assume increased demand for most things, you'll notice the price tends to go up. Okay, what does the mathematicians have? Yeah, to well, about? also I should point out that the, the effect of the having is actually having. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, when there was only, you know, after the first halving period, 50% of the Bitcoin had been produced. And when it's cut down to, you know, from 50 to 25, um, that's a pretty significant jump in inflation. Like it was something, you know, you had like, I don't know, 10% yearly inflation or maybe 20, it was like going from 20% to 10% yearly inflation. Now we're going to go, I don't know what it is, but it's something like we're going from like 1.2% yearly inflation to like 6% yearly inflation or something like that. Um, and this might be the next one. Um, and this is this is very small um, because you're, you're now looking at like the total supply, which is out there and people are, have bought and they're selling and they're using. Um, so the, the amount of new Bitcoins is just a trickle and these aren't actually affecting most people's decisions to buy or sell Bitcoin. Uh, it's, Bitcoin that they've just that's been out there and it's on the market. So I think it's it's kind of weird to just look at this input supply, you know, the new issue as like the only thing which is up for sale when clearly uh, a lot of people are just selling it for, you know, because they want to make profit or, uh, you know, they think profit or they think it's a good time to sell. Thanks. All right, everyone. The question just keep coming in. So I'm just going to keep going. This one maybe, yeah. Lots of talk about hash rate. What would secure the network better? Better double the number of of miners or double the nodes? Yeah, I mean, there the number of, of nodes that doesn't matter. What matters in the end is the number of hash in the network. Um, so I think that's the only way you can make it more secure. But also diversity, right? You don't want to like you don't want to have one single miner having a lot of the mining power on the network um okay yeah an attacker okay. only needs like a minimal amount of nodes you cannot overwhelm um an attacker with nodes all they have to do is just spin up their own nodes in order to uh you know proliferate all their their mischievous blocks okay we'll just keep going here i'm, I'm glad that the that people are asking questions are engaged. We appreciate it. What do you think in, inscriptions and such things affecting mining business, e.g. totally new dimensions and block production and now not all Coinbase released? Satoshis are the same, right? It's something that nobody perceived. This underlies the fact that we can speculate as much as we can, but now there is a there was a last resort block space, but now there is a last resort block space buyers. This is not theory. This is the market litmus test. I'm going to defer to the panelists because I'm not sure what's meant by this. So. so, I mean, I wouldn't say at this point that we now have a last resort. Um, we, we've seen inscriptions for um, a few months and they've been, you know, they, they've massively increased the demand for block space. It's very unclear that this is going to, uh, you know, that this has any lasting effect. I mean, it, it could be here in 10 years. I mean, it, it could also just kind of, um, you know, go away uh, next month. It could, you know, maybe not. Like there's something called Counterparty, which was about 10 years ago where people tried to do this as the first attempt 
to do this um, with the Bitcoin network. We didn't have the same, you know, we didn't have Taproot back then, um, but people tried to do this with Counterparty and they did, they they had some early peepees, peppies, um, pepes, is that how you say it? Uh, um, these, there's some early versions of this, but uh, people lost interest in that. Uh, and I think, I don't know if people are, are they still buying CryptoKitties? I don't, I don't know. I like, I, I can't keep up. There's CryptoKitties um, a few years ago. And then there's these, these bored apes. Um, it may or may not last. I don't, <laughs> that's. Okay, sure. Okay. But, I mean, there's, I'm going to ask, Patricia, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to ask Patricia, Patricia, how much time do we have left? Cause we've got a lot of more questions that. Came we have show. we have 10 more minutes all right so left, should we keep going does everyone want to just keep going i'll just keep going i actually see a question um uh specifically for bennett um okay, would you like me to read? okay bennett based on your reply about price manipulation do you disagree with the statement that centralized exchanges are manipulating the price of bitcoin to liquidate uh short long positions of their own, customers. Um, their own customers, or that industry players collude with Tether to manipulate the price. I will say that we have seen evidence of various bad actors in the industry absolutely trade against their customers and seem to take advantage of information about how those positions are set up. Now, that doesn't mean like, there is manipulation across many of these cryptocurrency markets. That doesn't mean like the value of Bitcoin in the market is entirely and solely due to manipulation. Um, there's clearly interested people paying actual dollars to get Bitcoin from people who are interested in selling it and vice versa. And those transactions are occurring with actual people who think that the price they are paying is a fair price for it. Um, as for the question about like industry players colluding, uh, the paper that's most commonly referenced to support this is Griffin and Shams is Bitcoin and Tethered paper. And I have never been convinced by this paper. It relies primarily on some strange flows related to end of month. And in the paper, they fail to discuss some of the other things that tend to happen at end of month that can cause this kind of thing, like CME's Bitcoin futures or other things that have specific dates that tend to align with that and instead only point towards Tether's attestations. The other things with the other thing with the Griffin and Shams analysis is if you take out the two highest values, the relationship basically entirely disappears, right? And so we've got these two data points that are really kind of defining the relationship that they use throughout the paper. So on that point, my general stance is we have we have nowhere near the information we would need to support a contention that the industry players are actively colluding with Tether to try to inflate the value of cryptocurrency. Okay. Hey. Here's, a, here's an interesting. There, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, just going to say, I'll jump back for a minute. There's another interesting point in your question here. Minor business, as we earlier pointed out, is just, all, all, sorry, OPEX and CAPEX optimization. But at the same time, miners generate additional revenues of business from demand response, stabilization plans, uh, stabilization plans, sell heat, et cetera. This might become increasingly important. Remember that the world is a large place. And waste heat is a valuable resource in northern areas of the world. What do you think about this? Yeah, I was actually just thinking about this. Is like this could go in both the centralization, the centralizing and decentralizing directions, right? Like the decentralizing directions is that um, you know the competitive pressure to find like zero marginal cost energy is going to push people to find out waste energy, and waste energy is pretty homogeneous around the world. It's like lots of waste energy, you just have to like find the right business model, whether it's methane um, capture, whether it's stranded solar, stranded wind, whether it's um, you know hydro, it's, it, there's a lot of it out there. And so that is a decentralizing pressure is sort of dispersing ASICs around, around the surface of the earth in different places. Um, now, the ownership of those of that geographic dispersion is a separate question, right? Because like you can have operations around the world, but they're all could be owned by one centralizing entity that can decide what to do with that hash rate. Um, so that's like a separate, like you have to decompose the question of like decentralization geographically, decentralization in terms of control and like ownership. Um, and then there's another question of like business models evolving beyond just, you know, hashing for Bitcoin is 
a lot of these businesses are getting a lot more sophisticated about developing their own firmware, their own, their own like actual um, machine designs Sorry. that aren't just like commoditized. So their own like sort of blocks to like have like blades like you have in modern modern server farms, um, like training courses, uh, franchise relation. Like you can imagine like a whole complicated ecosystem where big Bitcoin miners essentially can like incubate, you know, franchise franchises, right? Or or sell their specialized software, firmware, training, commodity equipment to other Bitcoin miners. Um, and those those that gives them an advantage and that could centralize over time. Um, yeah. I, so yeah, it's a complicated question, right? Like it's physical energy is a fundamental input, but then there's business models and capital capital structures which tend to centralize. Okay. Um, on, on that same uh, topic, it's it's important to know that right now, like the the, the mining revenue is about ten billion dollars a year, roughly on order. If you look at the energy industry, um, all energy in the world, this is like orders of magnitude larger than that. So if the mining industry gets kind of mixed up with the global energy, um, you know these these huge corporations, these. You know, Mining could be a very tiny subdivision in a corporation and they could restructure and like, oops, we just completely, hey, you guys are gone now, um, which might be, you know, this, this small, this small portion of, of a giant company, which is making all this revenue, um, could be like most of the, or a large chunk of the Bitcoin mining. So it's being sort of yoked to this other industry could be somewhat Make make Bitcoin somewhat uh, unpredictable, at least the mining security. We've got one last question here. That um, some other. I appreciate that the uh, that the participants are kind of sending messages back to back and forth to each other. I'm not sure if that's your attention, but unless there's a specific question, I'm not going to address it. But the last question here that's in the that's in the chat. Oh, there's just another one came up. Thank you. What are your thoughts about so-called Bitcoin covenants? Does anybody have any? And then somebody said, "Great point, Bennett, about the market manipulation." But what does anybody have anything to say about Bitcoin covenants, to the extent that they actually exist? But no, I mean, I I saw the debate last year. I don't know that it's like a huge deal either way. Like I didn't see it as a huge risk, and I, but I also didn't see that this would really change things drastically. Maybe maybe. I didn't look much beyond, but that's my. Okay, yeah. here's an interesting question here. I, I, oh wow, there's a lot that somebody wrote. I think we're gonna have to cut it off here after this question. I think. yeah, I'm about to this run out of time. But maybe what we could do, while you, while you all are, while we're finishing up here, there's one last question here, which I don't know. I don't think anyone will be willing to want to answer, but maybe they will. Um, but this, and then there's another long statement. Um, I'm not sure there's a question there, but anyway. Um, so the question that someone had was, would panelists, it's up totally up to you all, would panelists be willing to disclose if they own any crypto tokens or hold positions long or short in equities relating to crypto? I'd be willing to disclose, I'm not a panelist, I'm a moderator, I have no Bitcoin. So there, so yeah. there, there you go with that. So does anybody else want to comment on that or... I I, I can. I've got a full financial disclosure on my website. You can okay. find it if you want, but I own no individual positions in cryptocurrency tokens or cryptocurrency equities. I own broad market-based index funds. So those may have de minimis positions in like Coinbase or other public companies that are nominally crypto, but nothing specific or held individually. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, I, I have uh, not much. I mean, I have a few, like over the years I've had transactions um i've mostly divested um i still have a uh, 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 one satoshi from from 20, 2014 i have a few i have a few crypto kitties um i have you know kind of dust that i've accumulated over the years but no major no, nothing major i've mostly divested okay mm -hmm. <laughs> oh i have i have at least like 40,000 lightning sats, so. <laughs> All right, I think we have. Dust. Well, no, we can more. finish up. I want to hear what Matt Pines is to say. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I uh, as of now, I own Micah's uh, crypto kitties. I just uh, popped a piece of metal. Oh. Stack. Um, okay. Yeah, so I have I I have, I have a diversified portfolio um, that includes Bitcoin, but Bitcoin only. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I diversification is the name of the game when it comes to um, 
personal investments, but I'm not a personal financial advisor. So uh, don't take advice from me. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's the same. I, I, I don't have Bitcoin. Uh, else, yeah. Yeah, same here. No Bitcoin. Okay, well, there are some other interesting questions here, but I think we're kind of out of time. We've got about two minutes yes. left. So I want to thank everybody for, for participating. Thank you to everyone for listening. We really appreciate it. And we would encourage you to go out and buy Micah's book. We're going to send you a follow-up note with a with with a discount code for the book and some other books we have. Um, I think what I what we'd be willing to do is, uh, Patricia, maybe you can capture these um, these other questions here, and for the ones that we didn't address, and maybe we can ask the panelists if you all don't mind. We can we can formulate some type of answers and and send them out to send the answers mm -hmm. out to folks is it in writing. Is that okay, everybody or panelists? Is that all right or yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. I'm sure we can work something out. Yeah. So, so we we'll go ahead and a follow up email to you all. We'll we'll um, we'll address the questions that we didn't get to. So on behalf of DeGroyter and myself, Steve Elliott, and the the DeGroyter company and, mm -hmm. and employees, thank you so much for to, for participating. We appreciate it, and we thank you for your support. And uh, we look forward to doing more of these in the future. And since you since you joined this call and you registered, you're probably on our mailing list. So you'll be hearing from us <laughs> in the in the future, but but we don't spam people. So you'll be hearing mm -hmm. only, you'll be hearing from us when it's relevant and we feel it's important. So thank you so much for participating. And thank you, thank you to uh, Micah, Bennett, Matthias, and and Matt for, for their great um, insight and discussion. And we really appreciate all the knowledge that you've brought to this, to this to this call and I and over the last month or two of talking to you I've learned a lot and I appreciate it thank you yeah thank you everybody for um really just all of your insights all of your knowledge and uh Micah thank you for talking uh to your book and how it uh, also ties into the Bitcoin landscape we all really appreciate it and um yeah, wish everybody a great day. And again, this um, video will become available soon and be able to uh, be shared uh, be shared with anyone. So thanks again. Thank you. And thank you, you to all the participants. All the panelists, you're going to be on online in perpetuity. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you to all the panelists who made time to attend. We appreciate it. Thank you. It. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.